Magandang araw po muli sa ating lahat at ito po yung ikalabing apat na installment natin sa maising pag-aaral natin ukol sa Biblical Theology. Ang nilalaman ng ating pag-aaral ay ang mga sumusunod. Una-una ay magkakaroon tayo ng pagbabalik tanaw sa ating previous lecture, ang Divided Kingdom. At bubuksan natin ang aklat ni Jonah, titingnan natin ang mensahe ni Jonah, at titingnan rin natin kung paano pagkakagamit dito kay Jonah sa bagong tipan at magagawa rin tayo ng mga practical application sa ukol dito sa aklat ni Jonah at sa panghuli ay titingnan natin kung paano nga ba ginagamit ito itong aklat ni Jonah ito ba'y allegory, ito ba'y parable o isang history sa ating review uh, moving back sa history na enshrine si Haring David noong around 1010 BC at siya ay nanungkulan o nag-reign siya for 40 years 970 BC ang sumunod sa kanya ay ang kanyang anak na si Solomon at ganoon din si Solomon ay 40 years din so noong taon na 930 BC ay pum- may pumalit sa kanya at dito na unti-unti na nag- magdi-divide yung kaharian ng ni David at ni Solomon na uh, kung saan ito yung bungad ng kasalanan na nag na isang kung tutusin ay civil war na maghahati dito sa labing dalawang tribo ng Israel. Ang magiging hati niyan ay 10 and 2. Pwede natin sundan yung pulang linya, pulang lane sa taas. Ito yung nagdi-describe or pinapakita yung history ng mga hari sa Israel. Ito yung Northern Kingdom. At yung linya ng blue naman sa ibaba, ito yung kasaysayan o chronological order ng mga hari sa Judah. Ito yung Southern Kingdom. So from 930 BC ay unti-unting sinusubaybay natin na rin mga transition ng mga hari patungo sa eventual demise ng Northern Kingdom na Israel at Southern Kingdom ng Judah. Kung mapapansin natin, yung pulang linya sa taas, o ito yung Northern Kingdom of Israel, sila ay na-conquer. Eventually, bumagsak ang Israel noong taon na 722 BC sa kamay ng mga Assyrians. At ang Southern Kingdom na Judah, ay, ito yung magpapatuloy pa rin for 100 years and so. So, after ng 722 BC na pagbagsak ng Israel, naroon pa rin ang bansa na Judah. Ngunit hindi rin nagtagal dahil taon na 586 BC ay babagsak din ang Southern Kingdom ng Judah sa kamay ng mga Babylonians. Sinayta so, natin yung kasaysayan ng divided kingdom kung saan isang kaharian sana ito matatag, malakas. Ngunit dahil sa epekto ng kasalanan at ng pagiging makasalanan din ng mga kanilang mga pinuno ay nahati ang kaharian into Israel sa north at Judah sa south. So ito rin yung magiging historical background ng mga prophets. Dahil tayo tumatawin ngayon mula sa mga panahon ng mga hari o tinalakay natin yung first and second kings ngayon ay dunduktong tayo patungo na sa individual books ng mga propeta. At isang uh, key text dito ay yung 2 Kings chapter 14 verses 23 to 29. Ito yung magsisilbi na historical background sa pagtingin natin sa mga propeta. So first thing to note, the prophetic history found in 2 Kings places particular emphasis on the history. At ito yung makikita natin na yung history ng Northern Kingdom and Kings. So, magsisimula tayo doon sa history ng Northern Kingdom. Sila yung unang nawala. Sila yung unang bumagsak at nakuha ng mga Assyrian. And the Assyrian Empire 
led by Shalmaneser III, had forced Jeroboam's great-grandfather, si Jehu, na magbigay o magbayad ng taong na tribute noong taong 841 BC. So, during the year 782 hanggang 745 BC, ang Assyria ay, kung tutusin, unti-unti silang humihina, nagiging silang fragmented into various governor-ruled states and threatened by an expanding kingdom of Urartu to its north. So, bagamat uh, babagsak sa kamay ng Assyria, itong northern kingdom, ang time na ito, kung tutusin, ay humihina din itong Assyria. At ang nanghihina na kaharian ng Assyria ay unti-unting lalakas muli. At ito ay dahil sa hari na siyang magra-reign na si Tiglat Pileser III. Siya ay naghari no 744 BC hanggang 727 BC. So until the Assyrian king, ito si Tiglat Pileser III, came to power during the reign of Uzziah. Ito yung hari ng Judah noong panahon na 792 hanggang 740. At sa Northern Kingdom naman ay si Jeroboam the second yun time na iyon. Shalmaneser or ito si Tiglat Pileser the third, he quickly established his supremacy over Mesopotamia, even over Babylon. Ang panahon na ito, ang Babylon ay up and coming na kingdom pa lamang. So, ang Assyria, sila yung established power, sila yung matuturing natin na malakas, sila yung world power noong time na ito. And few armies were as hated as the Assyrian army, even in a time and culture that was not known for respecting human life. Assyrian tactics and policies toward their enemies were notoriously brutal. Pagamat um hindi uso non time na ito yung tatawag na human rights at kah kah ito sabi na natin yung uh, mga rules or engagements sa mga tingmaan, ang time na ito ay very brutal, very um, no mercy kung tutusin pero walang uh, walang papantay dito sa Assyrian na ito. Siguro maari natin makita sa mga pelikula kagaya ng 300 and then yung kanyang sa sequel. Uh, makita natin gaano ka brutal itong mga Assyrians din. Sa so, matapos natin tingnan yung kasaysayan ng divided kingdom pati rin yung kanilang invader na si, na Assyria. Ngayon ay bubuksan natin ang aklat ni Jonah. Ang 2021 na Lenten season ay nagsimula na. Sa katunayan, nagsimula ito noong February 17 at matatapos ito ng April 3. At isa nga sa prominente o popular na tradisyon ay ang tinatawag na abstinence from eating meat. Yung hindi kakain, yung mga devoted na Catholics ng laman ay either chicken, pork, or meat. Kaya ang other option is to eat fish. Is that? Marami at sa karamihan siguro ng mga Pilipino, Roman Catholic man o hindi, ang sinasabi nga nila na umaaray ang kanilang wallet dahil mahal ang karne at ang tila ang default. Sabi nga nila, ang pagkain ng mga mahirap ay ang isda o yung specifically galunggong. Sa katunayan, marami nga na inspire dito sa kwento ni Jonah. At sa katotohanan lang, ay sinama ito ni Michael Angelo nung sinimula niya i-paint ang Sistine Chapel. So, yung ceiling nito makikita doon, may portion doon na dinedicate dito sa storya ni Jonah. A first thing to note, ayon sa 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, a prophet by the name of Jonah, son of Amittai, Uh, nabanggit nun si Jonah, he was active during the reign of Jeroboam II. And there is a good reason to equate that Jonah without one mentioned in the book of Jonah. So, to appreciate yung mensahe nito ni Jonah, ang bawat reader nga dapat ay magkaroon ng understanding ng historical context nito. Kaya sinimula natin pag-aral na ito sa his- kanya historical background. And unlike yung contemporaries ni Jonah na kagaya ni Amos at ni Hosea, si Jonah ay lumaki sa Northern Kingdom ng Israel. So while the Assyrians had been very aggressive enemy against Israel a century earlier, by Jonah's time their power had waned. Ito nga yung nabanggit ko kanina na yung time na iyon ay humihina rin kung tutusin ang Assyria until mag-come into power itong si Tiglat Pileser. <coughs> 
noong taon na 722 BC, yung Assyrians would capture Samaria, ito yung capital ng Israel, at idideport yung 27,000 na inhabitants mula dito sa Samaria patungo sa ibang lugar. At ang ipapalit sa kanila ay foreigners dito sa lugar na ito, foreigners na ma- yung maninirahan dyan. And Jonah possibly knew from Hosea's preaching that the Assyrians were a threat to the future well-being of Israel. Ito yung matatagpuan sa Hosea chapter 9 verse 3, chapter 10 verse 6, chapter 11 verse 5, and as well as sa Amos chapter 5 verse 27. There is a very strong evidence na conscious itong si Jonah from the outset that God would pardon the Assyrians of Nineveh and not that destroy their city. Jonah tried to prevent this from happening by fleeing from God's presence. He hoped to secure the future safety of Israel. So dito makita natin sa mapa yung may red na box. Ito yung city ng Nineveh. Dito dapat papunta si Jonah. Pero do sa blue na box naman, ayun yung Tarshish. Ayun pupuntahan ni, ni Jonah. Pumunta siya sa Jopa patungo sa Tarshish. Yung blue na box dyan, yan ay ang city ng Jopa. So to go further or palayo, mas malayo, farther dito sa Nineveh, pwede siyang pumunta westward or southward. Sabi nga ng ibang commentators, ang westward neto ay patungo somewhere near or going to Spain. So, tingnan natin ang mensahe ng Jonah. Simulan natin dito sa chapters 1 and 2. Saan makita natin Jonah, the sailors, and deliverance. So, in the opening verses, God tells the prophet Jonah to go and preach against the city of Nineveh. Surprisingly, instead na siya ay sumunod, si Jonah ay lumayo pa. He flees God and takes a boat headed for Tarshish in the opposite direction. Ang Nineveh ito ay located sa northeast of Israel, habang yung Tarshish is at the other end. Then God hurls a tremendous storm against the boat. Uh, so yung sailors they try frantically lahat ng ways na possible yet unsuccessful to row back to land eventually they confront Jonah and discover he is the cause of this fearsome storm so reluctantly ay inihagis nila ito si Jonah patungo do sa dagat sa karagatan and the storm ceases immediately causing the sailors to fear God and to offer sacrifices to him So, alalahanin natin yung ganitong klaseng logic ay kagaya ng mga kaibigan ni Job. They are using yung cause and effect reasoning. Halimbawa, dahil nga tinapon nila o hinagis nila si Jonah do sa karagatan ay tumigil ang itong matinding storm. Ito yung cause and effect. At similarly, ganito rin yung sa pagsabi o pagsulat sa Proverbs at kahit yung sa Deuteronomy. Pero maging babala sa atin, maraming superstitious beliefs na requires a sacrifice to the appeasement of gods or supernatural creatures or phenomenon at hindi basihan o hindi tamang gamitin ang account na ito para i-justify na kailangan mag-sacrifice para magkaroon ng mapayapa o kapayapaan yung matinding bagyo o kahit yung karagatan. At ngayon, ma-encounter natin yung great fish that swallows Jonah. So, this is the way the Hebrew Bible calls this creature and we immediately assume it must be a whale. The early Greek translation of the Old Testament, yung Septuagint na tatawag, translates this with the Greek word that means a sea monster. So, Jonah spends three days and three nights in this creature do sa loob nitong great fish na ito. And also, in chapter 2 of Jonah, the prophet cries out to God from within the creature. So, in this regard, Jonah chapter 2 is very similar to some of the Psalms. So, kung saan God hears the cry of his saints na sila tumatawag sa Diyos. And here, God hears Jonah's cry and the creature spits him up into the dry land. Next, we come to chapters 3 and 4 na itong Jonah. Jonah, the Ninevites, and Deliverance. So, Jonah is now more obedient and finally goes to Nineveh and preaches a very brief message of coming judgment. Sa katunayan, Nineveh, this is a great city. Ang sabi nga doon, three, three days journey in breadth. Ito yung sa chapter 3 verse 3. So, three days journey daw yung haba o yung lawak na itong Nineveh. 
But Jonah only covered a third of it. Sabi niya sa verse 4 na chapter 3, going a day's journey. But in spite of all of this, through the power of God in the faithful proclamation of the word of God, tinawag sila ay mag-repent, sila ay mag pumunta, tumalikod sa kanilang mga gawain at tumapit sa Diyos sapagkat God will destroy them dahil sa kanilang wickedness. Ito yung mensahe na pinokrama ni Jonah doon. And the power of God, through the power of God, the people of Nineveh repented. Ito yung makita natin sa verse 5 ng chapter 3. Then next, we can see that Jonah became angry and complains to God that he knew God was gracious and compassionate and that was why he did not want to preach to the Ninevites. It is verses 1 and 2 ng chapter 4. So, masasabi na natin na ito si Jonah, kagaya na isang pouting child, yung uh, bata na nagre-reklamo sapagkat hindi nakuha ang kanyang gusto. Jonah then asked God to take his life. God instead gave Jonah a mild rebuke. Jonah then goes outside the city to sit and wait to see what would happen. Surprisingly, God provides another miracle in the form of a plant, providing shade to him. So, ito yung ginawa ng Diyos. However, on the next day, the worm, isang worm, kinai yung plant. Jonah complains to God again. God pointed out that Jonah was so concerned over the plant, yung well-being ng Actually, well-being ni Jonah sapagkat nag-provide na shade itong plant na ito mula sa init na, matinding init ng araw. So, ito talaga yung concern ni Jonah yung kanyang well-being. But that he had no concern for the entire city of Nineveh. Then, we can also see many parallels between the story to sa unang dalawang kabanata ng Jonah at yung last two chapters nito. So, Jonah 1 and 2 parallel with the story in Jonah chapters 3 and 4. So at the start, Jonah is disobedient but ends up praising God for his own deliverance. At ngayon, he is obedient but ends up criticizing God for the deliverance of others. Likewise, the boat, sailors, the captain, and the giant fish do sa chapters 1 and 2 ay masasabi natin parallel kagaya na city of Nineveh, yung mga ta Ninevites, yung hari ng Nineveh, at as well as the plant. Sapagkat ito nga ay masabi na natin na dahil nga do sa nangyari, do sa account ng boat na kung saan in-encounter nila yung matinding bagyo at, and eventually the captain and the sailors were delivered sa pamamagitan ng pag Hagis nila kay Jonah patungo sa karagatan. Ganon din yung mga Ninevites, yung mga tao doon, pati yung hari. They were delivered sa pamamagitan ng repentance. And as well as nagbigay rin ng comfort dit ang plant dito kay Jonah. Kagaya ng pag-comfort sa kanya, instead na siya ay mamatay, malunod sa dagat, ay in-swallow siya ng great fish. Dito naman, instead na masabi natin ma-burn siya, o magkaroon ng matinding discomfort ay sinaklawan rin siya na itong malaking plant na ito. At ngayon ay tignan naman natin kung paano ginamit itong Jonah sa bagong tipan. So there are three brief references to Jonah in the Gospels. Nariyan ng Matthew chapter 12 verses 39 to 42, chapter 16 verse 4, at yung Luke chapter 11 verses 29 to 32. Sa, sa tatlong passage na ito, ito brief references lamang, Jesus speaks of the sign of the prophet Jonah in the context of a wicked and adulterous generation na siyang humihingi ng isang senyales, ng isang sign. So, the intended sign, according nga dito sa Luke account, dito sa Luke chapter 30, involves some kind of resemblance between Jonah and Jesus. Although with Jesus, something greater than Jonah is occurring. Makita ito sa chapter 11 verse 32 ng Luke na kung saan binabanggit to something greater than Jonah is within their midst at ito si Jesus. Kaya maging babala lamang rin sa atin, bagamat may parallels dito, yung drawing parallel between Jonah and Jesus, it must not be pushed too far for they are in many ways different. So, of the many possible parallels between them, masasabi natin na apat yung pinaka-apparent sa kanila. 
Unang-una, Jonah and Jesus called people to repent. Ito yung mensahe mismo na daladala yung pinronounce ni Jonah sa Nineveh at ganun din yung pinaproklama ni Jesus sa kanyang earthly ministry, one of repentance. So as Jonah was three days and three nights, ito yung second na, na masasabi natin parallel, three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, Si Jesus Christo rin will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Ito yung wording sa Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. So ito yung isang parallel again. Third parallel na masabi natin na apparent, the activities of Jonah and Jesus result in repentant Gentiles being saved but wicked Israelites Jews being punished. Sa account ni Jonah, makita na siya ay isang hudyo. Pero nakita yung katigasan ng kanyang puso sapagkat hindi siya concerned sa makatid or sa katotohan na ayaw nga niya na magrepent itong Ninevites sapagkat ito yung mga kalaban ng Israel but also in time of Jesus makita natin yung wickedness yung katigasan puso ng mga Israelita sapagkat hindi lamang yung mga paraseyo o yung mga saduseyo but also they are the ones who rejected him at sa makatwid it produced the repentance of Gentiles And fourth na evident na parallel, both Jonah and Jesus sacrificed themselves in order to save others. But God delivers them from death. Makita natin si Jonah, ay sinacrifice ng mga sailors and the captain. God delivered Jonah from death sa pamamagitan ng big fish. At dito si Jesus man, he is the ultimate sacrifice in order to save sinful men. So the point being is this, that the sign of Jonah may consist some or all of these elements. Ito yung masasabi natin na within boundaries ng parallels ni Yeso Cristo at ni Jonah. Itong apat na apparent na parallel ng aking nabanggit. So pagamat yung account ni Jonah ay masasabi natin nangyari noong 8th century BC. Ito yung time na 799 BC hanggang 701 BC. Uh, ito ay very relevant pa rin ito ay very timeless so for all time paano nga naman natin i-apply ang account na iyon sa ating buhay ngayon may tatlong bagay una una obedience to God pangalawa God's compassion and pangatlo God's indictment firstly obedience to God God already gave us His word ito ay para sa ating kabutihan para tayo turuan or i-correct tayo ma-reproof tayo and to train us in righteousness. Ito rin sinabi sa 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 na sa ganun ma-equip yung man of God para sa kanyang paglakad sa pagpapakabanal. Ito yung obedience sa salita ng Diyos. Ito yung dapat natin makita sa account ni Jonah na may apply natin in obedience to His word. Secondly, God's compassion. So keep in mind that one of the major themes running throughout the Bible is that God saves the most unlikely people. Mababasa natin si Canaanite, yung Canaanite na si Rahab, the Moabite na si Ruth, at pati dito sa ating account, the entire city of Assyrian Ninevites. At kung titingnan natin sino nga ba yung most likely to be saved, wala. Dahil tayo lahat ay makasalanan sa harapan ng Diyos at tayo nga ay nagdi-deserve ng kanyang wrath and judgment but God in His compassion is saving the most unlikely of all ang mga tao na tunay nga sincerely nga na nakikita nila na pangailangan nila ng tagapagligtas and thirdly God's indictment so if we are more concerned with our own well-being than with the needs of the lost then we are also indicted kagaya nito ni Jonah na pinakita lang, nireveal lamang ng Diyos na concern siya sa kanyang comfort, sa kanyang well-being, at matindi yung kanyang galit na ayaw niya na masave yun iba, lalo-lalo na yung mga kalaban. At ganoon rin tayo, if we are well concerned with our own selves, na gusto natin tayo ng maligtas, at hindi ang iba, then pinapakita lamang rin na tayo ay also lost too, that we need a savior from that own well-being concern. At sa ating extra discussion patungkol dito sa aklat ni Jonah, titingnan naman natin the story of Jonah. Ito ba allegory? Ito ba parable o isang history? Allegory, uh, isang sikat na example ng allegory ay itong Aesop's Fables. Uh, isang sikat na parable naman is the boy who cried wolf. At ang isang history, sabi natin tunay na ganap na sa kasaysayan ay ang attack sa Pearl Harbor.
So, simulan natin kung ang story nga ba ni Jonah ay isang allegory. So, the story of Jonah as allegory, ito ay masabi natin uh, or defined natin, sabi nga ng Miriam Webster, allegory is a story, poem, or picture by means of symbolic fictional figures and actions of truths or generalizations about human existence. So, ang meaning o oh, saan ba nanggagaling ang salitang allegory, ito ay nagmumula sa salitang alios at egori na ibig sabihin lamang ay alios is other at yung go goria is uh, speak or mean so other meaning ito yung in a literal sense ito yung allegory sa paggamit nito sa isang literature at sa isang philosophy ibig sabihin nito ay may hidden and higher meaning na tatawag hindi rin iba ang Jonah sapagkat throughout human history marami ang nag-apply ng allegorical interpretation dito sa Jonah. Ay isa nga sa pinaka-prominent na allegorical interpretation sa account ni Jonah ay ito. Unang-una, Jonah as the figure that represents Israel and the large fish as the Babylonian world power world power that swallowed up Israel. Nineveh as the conversion of the Gentiles and Jonah's complaint as the objection by the Jews to the inclusion of these Gentiles. Ito yung prominente na allegorical meaning na inilalagay dito sa story or sa account ni Jonah. Ang isang kritik lamang dito as with other allegorical interpretations kagaya ng mga marami pa. Hindi lamang Jonah nilalagay ng allegorical meaning at as with using an allegorical interpretation one would need to impose meaning to all other elements in the story halimbawa ano yung pwedeng higher meaning ng tubig na bumalot dito sa big fish or ano yung meaning ano kaya allegorical meaning dun sa sailor sa captain sa ship so makita natin na dahil nga gagamit ng allegorical meaning kailangan lahat ng mga elements dito sa kwento ay merong higher na quote and quote meaning so we need to impose meanings to all other elements in the story and be very creative enough to make it sound consistent in consideration of the meta narrative meta narrative ito yung kabuuang flow singular flow na overarching na kwento ng Biblia ito yung pagtutubos ng Diyos sa makasalanan tao at hindi lamang yun, dapat maging consistent din ang Jonah sa other books of the Bible kung ito ilalagyan ng allegorical meaning. So definitely, napakahirap na panghawakan bilang allegory itong storya ni Jonah. So secondly, titignan natin the story of Jonah as parable. So by definition, a parable is a usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle ang ginamit nga natin na example kanina patungkol sa parable ay yung the boy who cried wolf so makita natin or kung familiar tayo dito sa kwento na ito nagde-demonstrate to tinatawid ng isang napakahalaga na lesson para matutunan ng mga hearers so isang critic lamang sa nagtitreat na as a parable nito story of Jonah this is quite long for a parable in the supernatural miracle elements found in Jonah are generally absent from near eastern parallels of the time at kahit din sa mga parables na umabot sa atin sa panahon natin ngayon halimbawa na lamang sa boy who cried wolf ay absent doon yung mga supernatural o yung mga miraculous events at hindi lamang yun ang mga parables ay usually short may isi lamang to convey a singular lesson samantalang itong account ni Jonah mula sa pagtawag ng Diyos kay Jonah hanggang sa encounter niya doon sa fish hanggang siya dumating sa Ninevites preaching to them to repent at doon sa kanyang complaint sa Diyos napakahaba ng kwento na ito at hindi lamang isang lesson ang kinukonvey sa atin ng account ni Jonah And lastly, the story of Jonah bilang isang kasaysayan o bilang isang history. By definition, history or historical narratives is based on or relating to actual events in history. So, masasabi nga na 
dal dito sa accounts ni Jonah, there may be some problems with dating the events and the miracles described in the book have been taken by some critics as an argument against a literal interpretation. At hindi lamang yun, sabi nga nila, the miraculous aspects of the narrative, such as being swallowed by a big fish and the rapid growth of of a gorgeous implant often often give rise to skepticism. So, sabi nga ng mga critics ay mahirap nga na kunin bilang kasaysayan to sapagkat very miraculous may may mga account may account ng big fish swallowing up Jonah tapos even worse 3 days siya na roon sa belly nitong big fish na to. At naroon rin yung account na napakabilis naman tumubo nitong halaman na kusang napakalaki nito para magbigay ng comfort kay Jonah against do sa heat of the sun. So ito yung mga sasabi ng mga skeptics patungkol sa isang literal interpretation ng account ni Jonah. But it is my position at ito yung aking paniniwala in all my study is that the story of Jonah is a historical narrative. Ito ay nangyari sa tunay na kasaysayan. For the following reasons, una-una, Jonah, Jonah is a historical figure. Nabanggit nga natin kanina sa ating panimula, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, na kung saan may tinatawag doon of a prophet named Jonah who lived in the 8th century BC. 8th century BC, meron tinawag na propeta na Jonah. So, this lines up the timeline of the events of the book of Jonah and it would line up with the Assyrian Empire being very powerful at that time. So, magtut magtutugma, papantay. Meron pro prophet Jonah yung time na yun. Tapos, ang kanilang kinahaharap ay ang Assyrian Empire na very powerful that time. So, meron correspondence dito. And also, the story presents itself as a historical narrative. Specific historical and geographical details are characteristic of historical narrative and not of allegorical stories. Ang actual places, actual events, actual people, ito ay very rare na lumaba sa isang uh, allegorical na story. Halimbawa lamang, do sa Aesop's Fables ay halos wala na nabanggit yung time, uh, place, and people na existing in history. Third is that there is no strong evidence against it being historical. Sa katunayan, pati ang mga historians, they would not consider the lack of corroborating historical accounts from Assyria to be evidence against the historicity of the book of Jonah. Ibig sabihin lamang, hindi ibig sabihin na wala nito sa accounts na Assyria ay hindi na nangyari yun. Sapagkat ang itong mga historians, whether believers man sila o secular historians, they, whether they believe the story to be true or not, ay hindi nila tatanggapin na sufficient or enough evidence yun evidence of absence. And fourthly, Jesus spoke of the story as having historical and future relevance. Sa Matthew chapter 12 verses 40 and 41, Jesus declared, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So, ginamit ito mismo na ating Panginoon na si Jesucristo as an indictment to condemn and contrast sa mga Israelita ang panahon niya. Sapagkat sabi nga niya, datating yung judgment day na kung saan ang mga tao na ito, yung mga Assyrians na nasa Nineveh, na nagrepent, nagtiwala sa Diyos ng panahon na nangaral si Jonah doon, they will be a witness against them na they have rejected the Messiah. So, ito yung makita natin na contrast kung sa bakit na lamang in my position and also sa majority ng conservative evangelical Christianity, the story of Jonah is a historical narrative. And now, we would connect the story of Jonah to redemptive history. Nabanggit ko nga kanina kung bakit mahirap paniwalaan na allegorical and parable itong account ni Jonah sapagkat we need to be very creative para maging consistent ito sa tatawag na meta-narrative, ito yung redemptive history, and as well as the other books of the Bible.
So we treat it as historical narrative and this and only in this sense ay may ko-connect natin siya. Hindi siya maging disjoint sa tinatawag na redemptive history o yung kasaysayan na pagtutubos ng Diyos sa mga makasalanan ng tao. So on the surface, the book of Jonah may lend itself to a moralistic interpretation. Na kusani Jonah disobeys runs away from God so God does some things and rescues Jonah such that Jonah finally obeys and God rewarded Jonah's obedience by the success na kanyang pangangaral sa Nineveh but this interpretation leaves us with a number of problematic questions lalo lalo na kung bakit kasama yung chapter 4 dito sa Jonah kung success stories lang pala ang kailangan dito ay might as well natapos na sana sa chapter 3 but chapter 4 is included. So at the heart of Jonah is the repentance of, of Jonah's preaching. So when Jonah announces the city's destruction, the Ninevites repent of their wickedness, thus averting God's judgment. The repentance of the wicked pagans provides an example for Jews to follow. This also shows how Jews should view Gentiles. And throughout the book, Jonah's disobedience and anger toward God is in contrast with the positive actions of pagan Gentiles. Jonah also explores the complex relationship between God's justice and mercy. Balikan natin chapter 4. Nag-complain si Jonah sa Diyos about the non-destruction of Ninevites and the city of Nineveh and then about the destruction of the plant that shelters him. In both instances, Jonah is so angry with God such that he considers his life not worth living. Jonah appraises God's actions in terms of how they will impact him personally. So ito yung pinapakita natin. Very complex ang ating or yung relationship ng justicia ng Diyos at ng awa ng Diyos. Galit na galit si Jonah. Marahil tayo din kung bakit hindi dinestroy ang ating mga kalaban. But instead, tayo rin ay nagagalit sa Diyos sapagkat dinestroy niya sa account ni Jonah yun bagay na nagbibigay ng comfort sa kanya. At tayo din, kung ito'y kinuha sa atin, mga bagay na nagbibigay ng comfort, convenience sa atin, marahil ay tayo rin ay nagagalit sa Diyos. So, pinapakita sa atin dito kung paano very complex or very uh, hindi worldly. Unlike us, ang Diyos ay meron ibang uri or ibang relationship sa kanyang justicia at sa kanyang mercy that he is just and yet merciful so Jonah's self-centered evaluation of God's actions reveals that Jonah wants justice for his enemies but mercy for himself but God is totally impartial as the gracious and forgiving God his mercy extends to the most unlikely people Jonah exposes our sin our shame and need for forgiveness and also point to the great shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, making such forgiveness very possible. Indeed, for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, God will tread their iniquities underfoot and to use the language and the story of account of Jonah, cast their sins into the depths of the sea. So, ganito natin makita natin how Jonah is connected to the whole of redemptive history. Hindi ito nagiging disjoint sa pamamagitan ng allegorical or as a parable. But in true history, makikita natin na tayo rin, kagaya ni Jonah, we complain. We are very angry sa compassion ni God and yet we desire mercy for ourselves. So, pinakita sa atin Jonah, na kagaya rin ni Jonah, dahil sa kasalanan natin sa ating puso, we need a merciful and just deliverer. At kagaya ng ating nakagawian o nakasanayan sa ating mga pagre-review ng biblical theology, book by book review of it, lalalano na na historical setting, tayo ay nag-iiwan ng takeaway verse mula sa aklat na ating pinag-aralan ng ating lesson for Itong installment na ito ay ang aklat ni Jonah. At ang akin po napili ay walang iba kundi sa chapter 4 ng Jonah kung saan pinapakita the mercy, compassion, and justice of God. Sa Jonah chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 it says, And said, But God said to Jonah, Do you do, do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. So verse 10, and the Lord said, 
you pitied the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Pinapakita sa atin, tayo bilang mga makasalan tao, we are very impartial. We desire mercy for ourselves and desire justice for our enemies. And kung tinanggal sa atin yung convenience natin or mercy is shown sa ating mga kalaban, we complain. Pinapakita rin na ang realidad na tayo nga ay makasalanan pa rin. And yet, God in His mercy, through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, sa kanyang self-atoning sacrifice, sa kanyang perfectong pagsunod sa requirements ng batas na law of God, at sa kanyang perfect na pagbibigay ng penal sa penalty ng batas, atonement was completely and finally made. At kasama na yan, na ang kasalanan na natitira sa ating mga puso na kusan we are very angry, angry enough to die sapagkat nagpakita ng compassion and mercy sa iba. But mag itong indictment sa atin that instead, we must be joyful, we must be happy, and we must rejoice sapagkat God also showed compassion and mercy to sinners other people and other sinners just like us. So, ito po yung ating takeaway verse sa ating lecture 14 ng Jonah na ay naging edifying ito at nagdagdag ito sa atin ng more appreciation sa pagtutubos na gawa ng ating triune God. Salamat po muli sa bawat isa at pagpalain po ang bawat isa sa atin.